Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Today we are delighted to welcome Professor Carl Brain. Carl is a Professor of Public Health Medicine in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care here at the University of Cambridge. Amongst Carl's many accolades, she was awarded a Commander of the Order of the British Empire for her services to public health in 2017. Her main research area has been longitudinal studies of older people following changes over time in cognition and dementia from a public health perspective. Today we're delighted to welcome her where she's going to talk to us about population studies and ageing brains in a time of Covid. Welcome, Carol. So thanks so much for inviting me. It's really great to uh, be doing this. I'm getting used to um, doing uh, the presentations on, on screen, but uh, it's still, you know, we're still on learning curves, so um, your patience will be um, very welcome. Okay, so um, I, I can see from those who've joined that there are probably a mixture of people who are familiar with the work that um, I've been doing over the last decade and those who are not. So, and I thought that would be the case. So I, I am actually going to do a bit of a context setting uh, to begin with. And then at the end, I'll just take you through what we've been doing, trying to respond to the epidemic and how it might relate to um, people's lives in the older age groups. Um, so I'll start off. Uh, so um, I'll start off with a bit of a, a bit about public health um, and the pre-pandemic context. Then I'll go on to describe the, the very focus on on the studies that um, I've been privileged to lead, along with many many collaborators from other universities and a, a fantastic team based uh, in the university itself. Um, and then how we went about repurposing um, this cohort study and our impressions so far. Um, so public health, just for those of you, because most of you will be neuroscience orientated rather than public health, um, and you probably have a sense of what public health is, and indeed there are lots of public health people who have different views about what exactly it is. But um, the definition that I really work to, which is a bit of an adaptation of one that is used by our Faculty of Public Health, is the organized efforts of society to protect, promote, and support health and well-being throughout the life course for contemporary and future populations. So it's both trying to optimize health in the present, but also um, balance that up against the optimization of um, health into the future and well-being. So this is physical and mental health. And of course, that includes social um, social uh, support as well, because that's so important to health and well-being. So it's very encompassing and it is um, overarching in terms of the potential. Many public health researchers necessarily must work in a focused area, um, but others look across the whole piece and try to kind of integrate information and evidence from different types of research. So the research has to be those little bits, those brick the, the bricks that build the house, or the bricks and the windows and the, uh, the furnishings and the plumbing and the electricity, basically it's seeing public health is a bit like seeing, seeing the house. And one of the ways of framing activities um, that we undertake in society is using the primary, secondary and tertiary prevention framework, which is not the same as cardiovascular um, Definition. So I'll just take you through that very briefly because effectively we try to create an evidence base in all of these areas. So primary prevention is upstream prevention of things that cause ill health uh, or adverse health. Um, and so that the, the classic examples would be human papillomavirus and cervical cancer, um, smoking and lung cancer, smoking and cardiovascular disease. Um, and of course there are a whole raft of other epidemiological examples for that. And so over time we've organised our societies to try to re reduce quite a few of those big primary, those big primary risk factors as it were. We, as humans we introduce them and then we, and then we start to control them. Um, secondary prevention is um, early upstream prevention 
of a disease or a condition once it's sort of set, up, set off. So uh, an example of that is early detection of um, abnormalities in cervical cells or um, in the breast through imaging screening and effectively secondary secondary prevention pretty well always requires some type of screening it might be in a in a health setting or in a or po at, po at population scale um, it requires a particular type of evidence base um, and that needs to be a very powerful evidence base to justify the expense particularly for population level screening and in the field of um, mental health in older people and indeed mental health across the uh, age groups um, secondary prevention is something that's discussed a lot um, in terms of early detection, um, but we really have to have a fabulous evidence base to justify its uh, implementation because you always do some harm when you implement secondary prevention. You don't necessarily, well, um, pretty well not with primary prevention. Um, and with secondary prevention, you, you do, so you have to balance that up against the good that you might do. And tertiary prevention is basically health and social care, uh, public health, in which one tries to assemble the evidence base on what can you do when something is present? How can you mitigate the outcomes for those who have a disorder? Um, uh, and that's a different type of evidence base. That's sort of very clinical, very, um, very patient-based or, or group, particular group-based research. Um, but they all contribute to health and well-being in society and in populations because the aggregated efforts of um, interventions for individuals um, are effectively changing population health. So each of these has a part to play. And as societies, we have to balance the investment into each of these. And what you could say for the COVID is that it's highlighted that we haven't really got those balances particularly well um, sorted out at the moment, um, not even in research, the research balance either. So I thought I would just, just remind us that um, before COVID, I mean, uh, COVID may have a little bit of an impact, but I suspect not much because the death rates are not massive. Um, that we are, an, we are living in an aging world, and this is one set of projections up to 2100. And the most kind of striking thing about this is not only the increase in the size of the population of the world up to seven, you know, up, up into the, uh, sort of by billions, um, up to seven billion, but um, also the, the distribution of age ages. Um, and it is very variable across the world, but all, all countries are aging, even those where the average age is still under 20, such as um, some African countries. So this um, top end here, um, we need to have an evidence base, a research base that understands the oldest old, um, because that is an age group which is accelerating in terms of its size across the world. And that's really important to think about when we're, when we're structuring and shaping the research that we do. The other thing that is well known about the pre-COVID world is the inequalities. So this is um, data, um, uh, data from 1999 to 2003 taken from Michael Marmot's uh, review of these uh, social determinants of health uh, 10 years ago in which he did a very very detailed look and I'll come back to this later a very detailed look at um, health and inequalities and he made some very striking and strong statements at the time in this report um, that uh, inequalities must be tackled and early life must be tackled um, and the reason why um, this is very uh, kind of really critical is that there's a huge disparity between healthy life expectancy um, in the people who are most deprived and people who are more, more uh, are least deprived and most deprived. So you can see there's a very, uh, a very marked difference between uh, the people who are in the least deprived with relatively little, this is uh, healthy life expectancy expectation, and this is absolute life expectancy expectation. So um, although in the least deprived, there, there are still some years of um, unhealthy life expectancy, it's, uh, it's really very small compared to those that um, uh, are in the most deprived. And so 
10 years ago, this was very marked, this was already very marked and in, indeed inequalities has been an issue for, uh, for many societies across time um, and some more than others. So that's by way of kind of context. Um, I'm going to jump now to give you the context in terms of the population based studies of dementia in which Cambridge has been involved. Uh, and this slide is pretty old. You can see <laughs> it's 1991. It's one of the um, syntheses of uh, evidence from around Europe about dementia prevalence uh, that was conducted under an EU grant uh, from by Bert Hoffman, who is now in Harvard. Um, and it's, it shows the prevalence, that's percentage of people who met dementia criteria in all these different countries. Uh, these were independent studies, but they were well conducted and they used um, diagnostic criteria available at the time. And what was extremely striking was the similarity of estimates across, uh, despite some differences in the study, kind of study conduct, the striking similarity of the rise with age. Um, and the, um, basically, this is, a lot, this is the same data on the right hand side, and it gives you this straight line which shows you that the rise with age is logarithmic effectively, and the, you've got a very striking uh, rise. It's not actually exponential, but uh, because as you get um, into the oldest old age groups, people are dying too fast for it to continue to be exponential. Um, so you get an asymptote towards the maximum life expectancy. Um, so these data have been around for a long time. They were highly influential at the time that we published them and uh, they have led to the focus, uh, really uh, were part of the focus of policymakers on dementia across time. And, and many of you will be working in this field. So um, those data don't, do include, um, oh, sorry about the typo on the slide, um, do include um, uh, Cambridge data, they include Cambridge Shire data and they include Cambridge City data from a study conducted, studies conducted in 1985 and 1986. But the cognitive function and aging studies followed on from that and were part of a national investment into dementia research or cognition research across the country to look to see where there was variation and what was the natural history of dementia and cognition across the country. So this was a longitudinal study that was set up in the late 80s and early 90s. And that study was um, a very strong collaboration across those, the universities in, that, in, in um, the, the, the relevant local universities, all of whom had uh, experience in doing population-based study, studies because it's, um, it's a very particular type of expertise and team working. Um, including multidisciplinary team working to uh, set up and conduct population based studies where you're going out and recruiting from true population samples people um, who you want them to follow up across time. It requires engagement with locality, uh, it requires training of interviewers to be absolutely standardized in their method in the way that they deliver the interviews. And it requires an approach to diagnosis that can be comparable across um, location and time. So in that study, um, which was funded by the Medical Research Council, uh, we had all of those, we, those kinds of teams uh, in place and a national coordination. And the study has been running since then with, uh, to begin with um, for many, many years with MLC funding. Uh, more recently with Alzheimer's Society and, and Alzheimer's Research UK funding. Um, that study was able to feed into, um, into national policy making, and this is just one example, uh, with the National Dementia Strategy. It took a very long time for that to get into the public domain. Um, we published the prevalence data, which were very similar to those that I showed from Europe, and uh, including Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. Um, but um, at the time that we published our data, the, the Department of Health didn't really know what to do with it, but it was when um, a colleague from King's, uh, Martin Prince and Martin Knapp, so that's a, a geri uh, old age psychiatrist, epidemiologist as well, and um, a health economist, got together and brought together all the evidence base, including the prevalence and all the economic data, 
that it uh, was uh, th that it had an impact. So this really taught me about how you how how you convey the results from your studies is just not enough to publish them in um, a good a good journal you really really need to get out there and link up to the places where the information will be helpful and useful so that was the prevalence data and the incidence data and the incidence data are about the occurrence of dementia in people at risk um, so people who don't currently suffer from dementia. And both measures are really important, along with mortality from dementia. But this study allowed us to look at um, people over time because we were looking at the whole population. We were me measuring cognition, functional ability, uh, comorbidity, mental health status, social engagement, all of the things that you need to really understand somebody's life. And that's what, when you're studying dementia, you sort of have to really understand a person's holistic state, not just their cognition. So we had all those data and we tried to, we've, we have tried over the years to publish as much as we can on population relevant data for um, both for research purposes and for, uh, and for service and for policy. So one thing that we were able to do was to look at dementia and severe cognitive impairment in the year before death um, in about 10,000 deaths, because the study was in 18,000 people, that original study of uh, 18,000 people aged 65 and over. And what we found was this, again, like the prevalence data, the remarkable rise of the prevalence of dementia and severe cognition at death, but with, up, with higher estimates, going right up to 60%. And if you, if you looked at mild and moderate cognitive impairments, then it becomes nearly 90%. So this is something about uh, cognition um, at, uh, at death, and it shows that whatever we do about preventing dementia in the future, we should always plan for people to have cognitive decline before death and be able to cope with that as societies, um, because it is actually quite rare um, for people to die suddenly. Um, most people have some sort of um, decline before they uh, die, particularly at very great ages. Another thing that we were able to do with this kind of study is with a, without any assumptions, look at the relationship between pathology and the expression of dementia during life, which is quite difficult if you, do, if you use standard designs. So, so if you're in a tertiary referral center in a specialist clinic, you will get to see people who are highly selected. If you go out into the population, you can select people and look at their clinical phenotype and see how, what their neuropathology looks like without any predetermination of who you're seeing. So this was from our brain donation work, which we started doing in the 80s. And we have collected quite a lot of brain uh, donations from people who uh, were very happy and willing to take part in at this aspect, this final, final contribution to research and their families um, were in agreement and um, very positive about it. And what uh, we're able to do in this exercise is look at the traditional ideas of dementia uh, and how much they contribute to the expression of dementia during life. So um, we have here brain weight, Alzheimer's disease pathology, vascular pathology and other pathologies. And this research does reveal that the, con the conceived or the preconceived ideas that come largely from the tertiary uh, service settings and, the, and very um, detailed research um, perhaps give a, a distorted picture of the importance of different pathologies in the expression of dementia in populations. So what we found is that age, um, sort of extreme age, accounted for about 20% of dementia in this, popu in this uh, population representative sample. Uh, brain weight, uh, low uh, or average, about 20%. The Alzheimer type pathology is only 20%, not 60% as frequently quoted. And the vascular pathology is about 20%. And these two have been largely, um, these, the link between them is only now coming back, um, having been separated off rather artificially in the 19th, uh, in the, well, the latter part of the last century. And so that you've got silo based research going on um, in each in se separated areas. 
which tend to reify each as separate entities. Whereas when you look in whole populations, you can see that these um, come together and that most people, in fact, in their uh, old, old age, have uh, both pathologies in their brain, uh, whether, whether they're demented or not, and I'll come on to that in a sec. And then other pathologies about around 20%, but perhaps a bit lower. Since this time, we've looked at hippocampal sclerosis, and that also, that's, T, that's a protein, TDP43, in the hippocampal area. And that certainly contributes in this other pathologies as well, and it's partly re represented here in this earlier analysis by hippocampal atrophy. So another thing that we were able to do was sort of challenge the, um, if you have these pathologies, you definitely have dementia. And this is um, an analysis, which again is from a, a quite a while ago, but these are still messages that need to get out there because there's a kind of accepted rhetoric, which um, is difficult to break. And I think if you asked a person in the street who knew a bit about dementia, whether if you had tangles and plaques, the hallmarks of, of Alzheimer's disease, that whether you would have dementia, they would say yes. Uh, and this slide shows you that that's not the case. Um, that uh, if you have atrophy, you might well, um, you are much more likely to uh, express dementia, whatever age you are. But if you have plaques or tangles, it matters what age you are, because if you are very old, um, uh, then your brain, even if you, if you die without dementia, is very likely to have plaques in it. So you can see these lines converging for plaques and tangles. And this is not, we're not the first study to show this, but um, there are many, um, it, it, it is a, a fact that is often not really um, recognized in the, in the dementia world. Um, other, other studies which focus on older populations have, have, have found this as well. And what, what you can see here is that if you die at 70 or people who are 70, there is a good separation between these things. So something different happens with, with old age. And so there are other things that relate to the expression of dementia, and they can be protective as well as harmful. So this is just an illustration of a, a paper that was published in Brain. I'm sorry, I haven't put the reference on. Um, and this shows you that whatever level of, um, uh, if, if you have a particular level of neuropathology, if you have higher education, you will be less likely to express dementia. So each of these lines, the red, the orange, and the green, reveals lower estimates for people who have had 12 plus years. This comes from a combined brain, population brain um, collection from Vanta in Finland, uh, the Cambridge City of 75 cohort, which were, was uh, one of the ones in that very first prevalence uh, estimation in Europe, and uh, the cognitive function and aging studies brains putting these all together which gives a uh, sample size of around a thousand, which allowed this uh, estimation of the impact of education in the presence of neuropathology. So here it's cortical tangles, um, and you can see that there does appear to be a protective effect of education. And this is uh, obviously, this is a finding that's well known now, um, but it's always, um, uh, to begin with, it was felt that it might be to do with measurement of dementia itself rather than um, rather than neuropathology. I have to say that when we did this study, I thought that the people with higher education would have less neuropathology in their brains, less vascular and less Alzheimer type pathologies. But in fact, they had the same amount, but they um, uh, but they uh, expressed less dementia. So it's another it's a different mechanism. Um, OK, so. Uh, we also were able to look at atypical um, pathologies and how they relate to dementia occurrence. So we weren't fixated on only um, Alzheimer type pathologies, uh, but also on other ones as well. So here we have granular vascular degeneration, Hirano bodies, gliosis, neuronal loss, and these have become more more um, a focus of attention uh, more recently. But at the time that we published this, what was striking was that they were rather disregarded. And neglected, and it's quite clear that in people, people who are older, um, and most people with dementia are in the older age group because the incidence is uh, our average incidence was 84 years. 
Um, so our brain donors are, uh, tend to be in the older age group. But for pretty well every measure, even when it's adjusted, quite um, heavily adjusted for uh, other neuropathologies, you can see that the estimate, estimates uh, for the expression of dementia um, with the neuropathology are pretty well all above one, even if they, even if they um, uh, uh, do go across the 95% confidence intervals do go across one. And notably here, brainstem has been pretty ignored in dementia um, research, and, and uh, many of these are really important, like neuronal loss, gliosis, and so on. These are all have all become much more, I think, more looked at since, since that time. Um, so that's kind of providing you with a context of the basic research that we were doing, but at the same time, we were trying to feed in the prevalence and the incidence into policymakers, things on multimorbidity and depression and so on. But while we were conducting these studies, um, something very dramatic has been happening to general health in the population. And here you can see a nice, uh, a nice illustration of the extraordinary drop in uh, the death rates from cardiovascular disease in the population, in our population in the UK, and uh, consistent across all the devolved nations. Uh, and given the importance of vascular pathologies, uh, of course, this is bound to affect the brain. So, um, no, it's not advancing, why is that? Yeah, um, so we, we, don't, we don't know exactly, but in Finland, they have been doing regular studies across time uh, with consistent methodology. So, so changes aren't just due, due to the fact that something's been defined in a different way. And they too have seen, as, as, has, as have most high income countries, seen this extraordinary drop in the mortality. In this case, it's coronary heart disease in women, um, but it looks uh, very similar for men. It's just an illustrative slide. And what you can see here is that these regular surveys in Finland have been used to estimate um, the, whether, they, whether these particular risks contribute to the drop in uh, coronary heart disease in Finland, in women. And that if you take smoking and systolic blood pressure and cholesterol, all of which are very well known risk factors for uh, dementia, these are the changes. Um, this is the amount that it would have contributed to the drop. Here is that the combined estimate for the drop. And then the purple line is the observed mortality. And you can see that uh, these risk factors alone do account for quite a lot of the drop in the risk for coronary heart disease mortality. So there's something very profound going on in populations. The risk factor profiles, our behaviors are changing in whole populations. And these risk factors are risk factors that have been um, demonstrated for dementia. So in the cognitive function and aging studies, we went on to raise the money to do a cross-generational study. And we recruited new people age 65 and over in the same geographic geographical areas, um, or in three, three of the same geographical areas, that's Nottingham, Newcastle, and Cambridgeshire. And we conducted um, the same, uh, we kept methods as similar as is possible in such a changed environment. Um, and we estimated prevalence. And um, despite the fact we had a lower response rate, so it went from 80, over 80% down to 56%, but we conducted a huge number of analyses to test whether it was the bias, a potential bias in the response rate that, that led to a change in the prevalence. But uh, we couldn't break the results, even with lots of sensitivity analyses uh, to check that out. And so the blue, uh, the blue histogram uh, columns here give you the prevalence from the original CFAS study in those sites. And the red gives you the estimate for the new generation. This is 2010, roughly. And what you can see is that um, age for age, at every age, apart from these younger age groups, the estimates are um, much lower in uh, the new generation than in the old gen than in the earlier generation, suggesting that age for age, dementia risk has dropped across generations. Um, this was very counter to the rhetoric at the time um, about the tsunami of dementia. And of course, if you change your definitions, you get more, you, you, you will and, and, and increase uh, 
the proportion of people that you pull in with your definitions, then you will see an increase. And that's what happened, happens if you look at medical records. But these are true population studies. And it shows that the actual absolute risk of, for individuals has dropped, which is great. You know, it's really good news. Um, and um, so attention has turned to thinking about prevention. So you might say, well, that's just one country. And in fact, uh, the Alzheimer's Association in the States, when we published it, or we, well, actually when we gave a presentation on this in, at the AAIC, which is the International Meeting on Dementia, um, it was, uh, um, <laughs> there was a, a bit of an attempt to sort of say, well, that's just one study that's a bit rubbish. Um, but in fact, this is a finding that has been replicated now by many of the other cohort studies in which there is an ability to look across uh, generations. So these, these are different ones here, the Framingham Heart Study, the Religious Orders uh, Study, the um, Three City Study, uh, Gothenburg Study, Paquid in France, and CFAS. Um, Sorry, the RS is the Rotterdam study. Um, and you can see here, if the estimates were staying the same across generations, across time, um, the estimates would be around one um, for all of these. These are just sub-analyses here. But in fact, uh, they're all below one. And the pooled estimates show um, this considerable drop um, with the And in this case, it's the incidence of dementia across 27 years. So this is now really confirmed for, high, for the high income countries in which these kinds of studies have been done. Um, so of course that brings us on to thinking, well, what are the risk factors and what has changed in societies that have led to this? And um, in this, um, a, a couple of years ago, not all that long ago, the Lancet um, commissioned with UCL a very um, a comprehensive look at risk factors for dementia or the state of dementia as it were and the evidence base on prevention and care, it was quite comprehensive. I'm gonna focus here on the parts of that, the, that commission which are about um, risk reduction and prevention. And it's just been updated and published this summer, got a bit of publicity, but um, not as much as it would have done if COVID wasn't around. And um, what, um, uh, what the uh, commission has, identified is that 12 risk factors get to global evidence level sufficient to be really taken notice of. And um, the new ones which have been added uh, or strengthened are air pollution um, and head injury and hearing impairment has become more prominent. Uh, this is one way of representing it. Um, and the next slide is another way. And I'll just show you, just having a bit of trouble with my advancing actually. Uh, here we go. Uh, um, and this one um, gives you more of a hint of how we might approach this from a policy and a public health perspective, which is a life course. So here, oh, here we have a life, life uh, here we have a, uh, a life course, and it takes each of those risk factors for which there's an evidence base in the global literature and tries to estimate the proportion of dementia which uh, it, this particular risk factor accounts for. So they're small individually, or potentially a little small individually. They operate across the life course, but added together um, and taking into account the interrelationships insofar as one can, the potentially modifiable are around 40%, perhaps 30 to 40% from earlier ones before the um, air, air pollution and so on went in, but um, it's sort of rising up to 40%. Um, the most dramatic one is low educational achievement. So what brings all of these together? I mean, pretty well every single one of these is associated with inequality. So that's uh, um, what is incredibly important. And that's the elephant in the room um, in that, uh, I think that we've paid far too little attention to inequalities in the dementia research world. In our CFAS studies, we found that inequalities uh, were associated in the more recent study uh, with the occurrence of dementia, so that the gains that we showed in terms of the reduction of dementia are largely, well, are more felt in the more affluent uh, less deprived areas than in the deprived areas. And this uh, is something that we have to take into account as researchers, even if we're working in a very narrow field. 
how does our research relate to the whole population? So here I'm just going to run through some of the findings from the Marmot Review, from the earlier Marmot Review. And um, I've shown you this one already, which is, um, which is men and uh, women, um, which is um, updated. So this is the updated estimates for men and women for healthy life expectancy and unhealthy life expectancy. And what can, you can see is that there is no uh, real um, Im improvement. Like the inequalities are still there. Here we have most deprived on the left-hand side of each of these graphs. Uh, least deprived on the right hand side where you can see there's narrowing of the gap between healthy life expectancy and life expectancy for men which is on the left uh, and there's um, not so much narrowing maybe sort of parallel for for the least uh, for the least deprived women but you can see a widening on the left hand side with for the most deprived women so in the UK women's life expectancy has now gone down and it's felt by the most deprived areas more. And so this fits in with the whole thing of brain health. Um, and the, every single risk factor that I've shown you, like smoking, is associated with um, social, with, with, with a disadvantage. So here we have it, uh, smoking in men uh, by um, occupation classification. And you can see a clear, clear blue water, as it were, between the different uh, social classes. In the next slide, um, uh, you can see the same thing for women, uh, where there's clear separation between the social classes and the percentage of uh, women smoking. Uh, these are, as I said, just keep reminding you, this is, this, these are all uh, um, you know, dementia risks. Um, and this is uh, alcohol attributable hospital emissions by small area deprivation quintile in England. And this shows you very clearly that there is a gradient for alcohol related emissions. So these are all people who are whose brains are at risk of dementia, and it is very, very uh, obvious that there's a strong relationship with inequalities. Obesity prevalence uh, also is uh, distributed very clearly uh, and going up um, in uh, different social classes. Again, here you can see that just that gradient. Um, this is BMI over 30. Um, and here it's the men, actually. And then the next one shows you it's slightly different. It's uh, for women, which is interesting in that the same thing, every, uh, the professional classes are managing to maintain their weight uh, at a very steady level, whereas the increases, the population increases are seen in all the other, uh, all the other um, groups. So um, we see this in that sort of all middle life type stuff, but it all starts much earlier. So coming back um, into that life course uh, um, diagram that uh, Jill Livingston and her co and colleagues um, created for the first Lancet Commission, going earlier in life, what we have here is reading at age 11 by social class and preschool experience. And here you can see there is the, 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 the reading levels are, uh, very uh, are, are significantly different across the different uh, social classes, meaning that from the outset, um, people are going to be at higher risk of dementia later in life, and then the, these inequalities um, accrue across time. And these are data from the British 1970 British uh, cohort study, and this shows you that um, for people who are in high socioeconomic status in terms of average position in the distribution, um, that um, the people who, the children who are in the uh, high socioeconomic uh, status have uh, a great chance, as it were, of developing good cognitive skills across their early life. Um, whereas in the low um, socioeconomic socioeconomic status they don't they say that they stay lower and those who start off high um, at uh, in um, their very early life they uh, drop down towards their the lower um, the those who are in the lower quintiles so you can see that they there's a kind of accruing disadvantage across time for cognitive development which will um, disadvantage them further when, um, when reaching middle life and then late life. 
and air quality also similarly. So when you see the next study being published about air quality causing dementia, think about inequalities and whether it, it really is very difficult to control these kinds of effects out. There is a very dramatic uh, relationship between quality of your environment and, uh, uh, and uh, deprivation. Um, so, um, that kind of all brings me to um, where we are now, which is there's a lot about political rhetoric at the moment that early detection technology and AI will solve all our problems. But I think I've tried to show you how looking in the population kind of throws up things to be, uh, shows them to be more complicated than one might think. And that it's very, very important to work with true populations in order to understand what's going on. And that your solutions will go well beyond quick fixes of any kind, whether it be technology and AI. These things and early detection, these things all have their place, but they're not likely to be the magic bullet in and of, them, uh, of themselves. So um, when we were finishing up the, um, in, the prevalence and incidence of the second CFAS study, the new generation CFAS study, uh, the AI, the idea that AI and technology could solve everything was, was, was emerging. And we thought it would be really very good to try to test that and also to see whether we could implement um, a trial within, uh, within a cohort study. So we brought in um, something called Healthy Aging Through Internet Counselling, and we repurposed uh, the study, which was an observational cohort, into a trial. And in that trial, we have a basic epidemiolo epidemiology uh, group, a group who are um, controls within the recruited intervention group, and then we have the, um, the group who actually have an intervention. And this is a coach-based risk reduction approach. So um, we had to have people who had internet availability. And by the time we were funded to do this by the ARUK, all our participants were aged over 75. So it's testing it in the older fold. Um, and that is um, clearly very important if we are to understand the reach of this kind of approach into the population. So that study has happened uh, between, 20, between January 2019 and September 2019 with a 12-week follow-up because it was a feasibility trial. It wasn't a long-term thing. Uh, and we recruited 655 people across our three sites. I'm not going to give you results from that today, but that was the base that we used to uh, recruit for COVID because we were in the process of finishing up that last study when COVID came along and um, so we we're analyzing, you know, working on that, those data in the background. Um, but uh, when COVID came, we realized we had a tremendous opportunity because we knew all about the internet um, use of those people who we'd recruited for the particular trial. So I'm just going to run through now with some very quick impressions of um, what we've found out. These are by no means the final results, um, but they're, they're the first pass of some of the um, things that we have found out. What we wanted to do was look at how policies have impacted older people and vulnerable communities. So we did telephone interview, interviews with those people who'd taken part in, the, uh, in any part of the intervention study that I just described. Um, we wanted to look at isolation, mental health, well-being, health, uh, general health, loneliness, social care usage, also the support that they'd received from others and how it might have changed since measures were introduced, and attitudes and use of the internet, um, and whether they had actively enabled or engaged in new learning. At this point in the seminar, Professor Brain presented some preliminary unpublished data that is not presented here. Do look out for this data from Matthews and Brain et al. when it will be published soon. So my reflections are, population cohort studies do provide unique information on health and well-being in representative populations. Um, and in general, they have lacked diversity and can lack inclusion of those at most disadvantage. We try to overcome that in CFAS, but it is only it is a predominantly indigenous white population. We don't represent um, ethnicity. Uh, at all, but we do represent um, uh, social disadvantage. Um, so despite the limitations, 
the findings here support an emphasis on the most vulnerable in the population. And that should have been before and during and after the pandemic. These are really important issues and messages. Uh, COVID control policies are likely to lead to increases in inequalities that were already widening before the pandemic. And these are all relevant, I hope I've illustrated, these are all relevant to brain health. And research funders and future programmes must tackle these challenges and balance investments better. It's much more than ventilators, diagnostics and vaccines um, and the sort of techno-optimist -optim futures. We have to have a much broader range of research out into the population and out and using different methodologies, including qualitative and social science. Um, and we urgently require a holistic way of thinking about people in their communities, drawing in multiple disciplines and life course approaches. So I'm going to stop there and thank you for listening. Um, I uh, always put the sustainable development goals up at the end because I think we absolutely must, as researchers, always have them in mind because we're not talking just about COVID and just about brain health, but also about sustainability of the human species. Um, and I'd like to recognize, although the views I've expressed on my own, the results I've uh, shown from uh, our studies have been, uh, um, have been uh, produced by many, many people, um, key collaborators um, in Cambridge and beyond, and uh, also our funders. So thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, for that very interesting talk. And thank you all for joining us. Don't forget to join us next week when we will welcome Dr. Rudolf Cardinal from the Department of Psychiatry, who's going to speak on the early impact of COVID-19 on mental health and community physical health services and their patients' mortality in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough areas in the UK. Sign up at the link shown here. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on Twitter at Cam Neuro to keep up to date with everything that is happening in Cambridge Neuroscience. See you next time.